Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. We're excited to have another great lesson today. Um, the title is Seeing the Goldsmith's Face. And as we get into this lesson, there's so much to discuss. It's very exciting. But before we start, Byron, will you pray for us? Yes, let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly mm -hmm. Father, Lord, we come to you on this Sabbath day. We come to you, Lord, with humble hearts. We come to you, Lord, on this day where you bless us, where you guide and teach us, where you mold us, that be by beholding you, we might be transformed. Lord, the lesson today is about seeing the goldsmith's face, seeing Christ Jesus, because he knows that we are purified when he can see his reflection in us. Lord, help us this day to learn about the crucibles that we may endure, about the character that needs to be transformed, that once was perfect with you in Eden, and Lord, through our sin, has degraded us beyond, almost beyond your reach. But Lord, there's some of that image left, and you seek to rebuild it in each and every one of us, that we might be stars in the heavens someday, Lord, that we truly might be that church to reflect your glory when you come again. Lord, teach us to be those people. Help us to submit to your will that through those trials and tribulations, we might be perfect in your eyes. Through Christ Jesus, Lord. We pray this all to your Father in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Our memory verse today comes to us from 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory or glo to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So our memory verse talks about being transformed. King James Version says changed. So this transformation is a change that goes on in our life to bring us closer to the glory of God. So this week's lesson, we're going to focus on the crucible of purification. Purification requires a standard. In our case, the standard is the image of God in us and of the image of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect reflection of the image of God. So Jesus reflects God. We reflect Jesus. There's a story that the lesson talks about of, of a young lady <clears throat> whose name was Amy, who were taking some children to a goldsmith in India. And he had a mixture that he would put together and then he would put gold in this mixture and put it in the fire. And as the fire was burning, he would r randomly take it out to check to see how the gold was doing, to see if the gold was being purified. And each time he would bring it out, he would put it back in to a hotter fire. And he did this multiple times and finally she asked him, how do you know that the gold is pure? And he replied, when I can see my face in it. So this gold that, that is tried in the fire, <clears throat> when it's pure, when it's ready, we can see our face in it. Just as when we are pure, we can see Christ, people can see Christ's face in us. So God is seeking to purify us, to refine us like gold, to transform us into his imaging image. It's astonishing goal, and it seems more astonishing that a Christ-like character is developed in us only as we pass through life's crucibles. So let's back up and review um, spiritual development just a little bit. So first of all, when we come to Christ, he makes us right. He, he, he justifies us. So first of all, the first piece of, of spiritual de development is justification. We see in Romans 4.25, he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So Christ's death was for the offenses that we had, but ra his, his raising and coming back, coming back to life and conquering death was for our justification. So when we first come to Christ, it's like when we're baptized, we're, 
that's, that's, a, that's a symbol of his death. So we are made just when we come to Christ. The next, the next part of our journey is sanctification. 1 Peter 1, 2 says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. So we see this sanctification of spirit is unto obedience and the sprinkling of Jesus Christ's blood. And we remember in temple services when they sprinkled the blood, it was symbolic of removing the sin from life, from, from our lives. And so this is part of that purification process, the sanctification that goes on through our, our lives. And the last is glorification. And glorification is when? When we get to see our maker face to face. Then we are truly, we have truly arrived. Revelation 3.18 says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve. To see ourselves in gold, to receive that eye salve, let's look at a couple of, more, of, of definitions. First of all, let's look at purification. So the definition of purification is the removal of contaminants from something. The process of extracting something from a substance, the process of making something spiritually or ceremonial clean. So that is, that is what that, that purifying that makes us spiritually and ceremoniously clean. Sanctification is the action of making or declaring something holy. The action or process of being freed from sin or purified. The action of causing something to seem morally right and acceptable. So we see that purification and sanctification go hand in hand. And um, we can see this in Revelation 7:14, where um, God is talking to the great multitude, or God is, or John sees God talking to the great multitude that are standing before the throne. And he says to them, Sir, you know who, sir, you know who are these people? And he said unto them, These are the ones that came out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So we see that the, to, to achieve salvation, there's a purification process that goes on. In fact, Ellen White says it very nicely in, um, in this quote. When the sacredness of Christ's character is brought into the daily life, God is glorified. In the work of the gospel minister, the same proofs are to be given that Christ gave us in his work. All who accept the responsibility of working as physicians and ministers are to perfect their efforts through the sanctification of the truth. Sanctification means purification. She says it just that simply. The wisdom that comes from above, at first pure, then peaceable. It is only thus that they can be qualified to do the work that Christ did in the world in proclaiming the truth. The word of God obeyed is the divine revelation that works in the heart and mind and sanctifies the soul. The words of truth are to be cherished. Not one charge given by God is to be disregarded. If obeyed, the word will restrain every evil thought, word, and act. It's pretty amazing that this purification process, I know sometimes people say, well, why do I have to go through this trial? Why me, Lord? I've said that many times. Because we won't learn any other way. That's true. We, we don't learn any, any other way. So let's, let's take a look now at the components of this week's lessons. Hebrews 1, 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and express image of his person by upholding things, the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ's life on this earth, earth was not easy. His death was caused by the heaviness of our sins. 
And, <clears throat> and so we see that this purification requires an agent, which the Bible often presents as fire. So sometimes our trials are going to be fiery trials to, so that we can be purged, so that, this, that, that his, his uh, gold can be seen in us. 1 Peter 1, seven says that the genuineness of our faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise and honor and glory the revelation of Jesus Christ. So again, this, the, these, these tests, these trials by fire that we go through, as it, as it purifies us, it honors and glories, glorifies Christ. The result of purification is seen in our character, represented by the oil in the lamps of the ten virgins in the parable of Jesus, and we're going to talk about that more. But the themes of this lesson are four. Suffering plays an essential role in the process of character formation and purification. We will see the char that character formation is the restoration of the image of God in humans as they are created by God in the beginning, as well as the shaking of characters according to the image of Christ. Number three, this formation of character entails the theme of the cosmic conflict. It is in this conflict between good and evil, God and Satan, that we experience crucible and maturity. And finally, four, purification and maturity are never achieved by individuals in isolation. Rather, purification and maturity are achieved by individuals in communities. So Byron, you're going to talk to us about in his image. In his image. So let's start off by reading the memory or the verse for that day, Romans 8:29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn that he is in Jesus would be the firstborn among many brethren. So, are we predestined for anything, really? Are we predestined for salvation? Are we predestined, well, we're predestined for death by choice, but God predestined us to all be saved. He died on the cross for everyone. And it is his hope and desire that we all would grab hold of that salvation. But what does that really mean? Because we see that the image of Christ on earth, but we also see the image of our original creation with Adam and Eve in, in the Garden of Eden. I like to read Ellen White, Education, page 15. When Adam, so this is what we know what we missed out on. When Adam came from the Creator's hand, he bore in his physical, mental, and spiritual nature a likeness to his Maker. So we were made in the likeness of God. Physically, mentally, and spiritually. God created man in his own image, as Genesis 1.27 says. And it was his purpose that the longer man lived, <clears throat> the more fully he should reveal this image. The more fully reflect the glory of the creator. All his faculties were capable of development. Their capacity and vigor were continually to increase. Vast was the scope offered for their exercise, glorious the field open to their research. The mysteries of the visible universe, the wondrous works of him, which is perfect in knowledge, that's Job 37, 16, invited man's study, face to face, heart to heart communion with his maker was his high privilege. Oh boy, we missed out on a lot. He had remained, had he remained loyal to God, all this would have been his forever. That would be Adam. Th um, throughout eternal ages, he would have continued to gain new treasures of knowledge, to discover fresh springs of happiness, and to obtain clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, and I love that word wisdom, the power and the love of God. More and more fully would he have fulfilled the object of his creation, and more and more fully have reflected the Creator's glory. That is what God wanted for us. Unfortunately, though, we read the next part, but by disobedience, this was forfeited. 
through sin, the divine likeness was marred as well nigh obliterated. Man's physical powers were weakened. His mental capacity lessened and his spiritual vision dimmed. He had become subject to death. Yet the race was not left without hope. Now, who is our hope? Christ, Jesus. And we know that even from Revelation um, 3.15, but we'll get to that later. We all know that sin separates us from God, right? Especially in our present condition. Just as Adam and Eve had robes of light and garments that were the garments of the glory of God, literally, that same righteousness that Jesus will clothe us again with someday for those that are saved. As soon as sin occurred, what happened with Adam and Eve when they were separated? They realized they were naked. That righteousness had left them because of their separation with God. Their reflection of God's glory was gone and fig leaves weren't going to cut it. So now we know how we started and we know what God would ultimately love to bring us back to. But as, it's, as Ellen White said, the image of God in us was almost obliterated. It's we're that far removed from how we were created. This is a steep hole to climb out of. Truly impossible without God. But you might say, how bad are we? Yeah, I'm a good person, right? I do things. I help out here and there. I'm generally pleasant. Well, Isaiah 64, 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like filthy, uh, gar a filthy garment. Other versions say rags. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. On our own, we have no hope. And Paul repeats that also in Romans 3, 10 through 12. Even if we think we're that good, or at least kind of good, just a little bit, without God, no. It's pretty depressing, isn't it? None of us realize, for the most part, just what kind of shape we are really in. And I love that um, from Ellen White in Education, that last line. Yet the race was not left without hope. So 1 Peter 2.22 says, it's referring to Jesus, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. So let me ask you, do you think Jesus had a harder test than Adam? By a long shot. In a way worse world that was laced with sin, through Jesus, our filthy rags become garments of fine linen without spot or wrinkle. Have you heard of the great controversy before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just here and there between G Christ and Satan. You know where it started, right? It started in heaven. And we read Revelation 12:12. 12, 12. For this reason rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he has only a short time. It may have started in heaven, but it's being played out right here and now, right where we are. And the consequences for us are eternal. We know who wins, right? God. He hasn't lied so far, and time isn't really a, a deterrent for him. So we know that he wins, but the question is, whose side are you going to be on? Are you going to be on that side where your image is purified, where God purges you of that dross, or are you going to be with everyone else? So there is a plan of redemption. We know this, right? And 1 Corinthians 4, 9 says, For I think... That God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, <clears throat> both to angels and to men. But the plan of redemption <clears throat> is so amazing. First Peter 1.12 says, 
it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. What is going on down on this earth is so amazing. Heavenly beings are watching with intense curiosity i'll put it that way to see just what god will do and we know that god wants to save us but do we know why is a great controversy about us no who's on whose character is on trial it's god it's his name that needs to be vindicated from the accusations of the devil and god has an infinite love such an infinite love that he can't leave us to our path of death through sin. We are a spectacle to the universe, not to the world, but to the whole universe. They are watching the plan of salvation play out. They've seen Satan seal his fate at the cross, and they've seen the character of God saving us and sacrificing himself for us. We call ourselves Christians, followers of Christ, and we have a clue what that means. We have a clue what he's done for us, but we'll never truly comprehend it. All eternity in heaven will be spent looking at that. But the question is, how do we act? How do we represent our Lord and King in heaven? I pray that we would all submit our lives to Jesus, our King, that he may begin a good work in us to transform our hearts and restore that image of God within each one of us. Thank you. Yeah. Scott, are you ready to tell us about faith amid the refining fire? That's right. <laughs> faith amid the refining fire. Sounds tough. So, yeah, I mean, this, this whole lesson is about this subject, right? So, um, <clears throat> this starts off with talking about... Um, the passage in Job where he's talking about um, his, his sort of bitter complaint. So it says, um, then Job replied, even today my complaint is rebellion or bitter. His hand is heavy upon my groaning, despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat that I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn the words which he would answer and perceive what he would say to me. Would he contend with me by the greatness of his power? No, surely he would pay attention to me. There the upright would reason with him and I would be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward and he is not there, and backwards and I cannot perceive him. When he acts on the left, I cannot behold him, and when he turns to the right, I cannot see him. <clears throat> but the way, but he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So that last section is the one we're focusing on, that we are to be like gold that gets refined in the fire until after enough crucibles of um, different trials and uh, tribulations we go through, we too shall come out as gold. Um, one of the stories from the Bible that is not in this lesson, but I, I thought it was very fitting, was the story of the three worthies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who... Um, literally went into a gold refining fire. So the, the furnace that, was, that they were thrown into was the same as that as used to make the gold image which Nebuchadnezzar set up on the plain of Dura. So let's read about that in Daniel 3, 23 to 25. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke to his counselors. 
Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They said to the king, True, O king. Look, he answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and for them and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So the furnace into which Nebuchadnezzar cast um, the three Hebrews was the same as that to use to melt the gold. Um, and there's at least four lessons we can learn from this story. One would be that God did not choose to save them before entering the fiery furnace, but rather enabled them to withstand the fire. Second is that Jesus himself, that is the Son of God, walked in the furnace with them. So we can expect that uh, he'll be with us in adversity. Third was that the only thing that was burned by the fire was their, bound, their bonds. So they were thrown in there bound up and the, the bonds with which they were tied up, those perished in the fire, but everything else stayed intact. Even their clothes didn't smell like smoke. And then the, the fourth one is that the faith in God of the three um, Hebrew worthies was used by God to glorify himself in front of the king of Babylon, in front of God's people, that is the Jews, and in front of the, represented, the unseen representatives assembled from, um, from the angels of God, the fallen angels, uh, as well as representatives from the different countries that were there. So uh, one application of this is that <clears throat> God's people will also have to go through the furnace of affliction, but Jesus will continue to be there with us and the only thing that will be destroyed is our bonds that hold us tied to earthly things while our faith uh, is revealed and it will glorify God in front of the universe. And then I also found, this was from our, I, I cheated here from the uh, teacher's commentary. I thought there was a good quote from Ellen White, so I thought I will um, read this. This is related from um, Huss. John Huss wrote this in a letter and he said, and it's, it's found in the great controversy. Jesus Christ suffered for his well-beloved, and therefore ought we not to be astonished that he has left us an example in order that we ourselves may endure with patience all things for our salvation. He is God, and we are his creatures. Uh, he is the Lord, and we are his servants. He is the master of the world, and we are contemptible mortals. Yet he suffered. Why then should we not suffer also, particularly when the suffering is for us a purification? Therefore, beloved, if my death ought to contribute to his glory, pray that it may come quickly and that he may enable me to support all my calamities with constancy. Um, so I, I found that interesting is that uh, some of the martyrs that are quoted in the, in the, about in the great controversy were also, um, while they were not, certainly not pleased with persecution, they were able to understand the, the role of it. Um, and then um, going back to the lesson about Job, um, flipping the pages too many times, even amid his terrible trials, Job trusted in the Lord. Despite everything, Job was determined to endure. And one of the things that kept him persevering uh, was gold, not the metal, but rather he was looking into the future and realized that if he held on to God, how much he would come out better for it. Uh, he would come out like gold. Um, how much Job knew of what was happening behind the scenes, we aren't told. I, I would presume he didn't know what was going on behind, besides the seeds. Otherwise, it might have been maybe a little easier for him. Regardless of how much was hidden from him, he endured the refining fire. So do you fear fire? Do you worry about the heat uh, that circumstances generate? Perhaps, as with Job, the heat of God seems unexplainable. It may be the difficulty of adjusting to a new job or home 
It could be having to survive Ill, Ill treatment at work or even within your own family. It could be illness or financial loss, hard as it is to understand. God can use these trials to refine you and purify you and bring you out, um, bring out His image in your character. So with that, I, I'd like to conclude and say that even though this fire is definitely uncomfortable, it's necessary for our advancement and uh, ultimately we'll have a good result and we will come out as gold as Job did. Thank you. Thank you. Mine. Now we're going to talk about Jesus' last words. And uh, it's interesting. It's kind of, you know, he was getting ready to leave. It was for the, during the Passover, and he was meeting with his disciples. So it's interesting that he would use these two parables for, um, for what he was going to share with his disciples. One is about the ten virgins. The other is about the sheep and the goats. And these stories are related to the way we should live and wait for Jesus to come. So their relevancy is for today. And the signs of Jesus' soon return is all around us. And is, this, is, is, this is as significant as it ever, has ever been. So we're going to start with the parable of the ten virgins. Um, I'm going to read through this fairly quickly, and then we'll take some time to, to look at it. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamp. But the bridegroom delayed and they slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. And those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise saying, No, lest there should be a not enough for us and you, but rather go to those who sell and buy yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. So this is, this is interesting in that there were, fi there were wise virgins and foolish virgins. And um, what was really the difference between the wise and the foolish? Now, Ellen White talks about the, um, the oil, the oil that was in their lamps, having enough oil, as the Holy Spirit. And so we see that, that oil is, is a symbol of character. That's something that no one can acquire for us. We have, to, we have to acquire that oil, that spirit ourselves. And she also says in Christ Object Lessons, we cannot be ready to meet the Lord by walking, waking when the cry is heard. So when the cry is heard, it's too late to wake up. Behold the bridegroom, and then gather up your empty lamps to have them replenished. We cannot keep Christ apart from ourselves and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. Though the Holy, through the Holy Spirit, God's word is light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of the word, the Holy Spirit develops the attributes of God. The light of his glory, his character, is to shine forth in his followers. Thus they are to glorify God, to lighten the path of the bridegroom's home to the city of God and to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So we see that this work that the Holy Spirit does within us is what, par is what made the five wise virgins wise and the foolish virgins foolish. And I want to take a look at Jude 1 and 3, because I think this gives us uh, insight into what the five wise virgins were doing. Behold, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common, the common salvation, 
It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Now, when we talk about contend, what does that make us think of? Well, the first time I, I really heard about contenders was in boxing. And it was usually the person, was the contender, was the one who was trying to beat out the champion. And so we look at, if you, if you look at a definition of, of contend, it's a struggle to surmount a difficulty or danger. Engage in a competition or campaign in order to win or achieve something. So our goal in life is to contend for what? For heaven, isn't it? And so to do that, it requires us to spend time with who? With Christ, doesn't it? To invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, to do that work, to understand truth. I have had people come up to me and say, well, how will I know whether, when, especially when it comes close to the end, how will I know? Well, I guess I'll have to wait for the church, somebody in the church to tell me. Don't do that. No, don't do that. That's what I said, don't do that. So we had a little Bible study. But it's important that we um, fill our lamps ourselves, that we each day be filled with the Holy Spirit, that we use that Spirit to light the world. And so it is, it, it is, is a grooming and, and a growing process. And we see what happened to those foolish virgins who didn't wake up until the end. They were, they were sat on the outside looking in, weren't they? And that's, that's not the place that, that uh, we want to be. So the second parable is the parable of the sheep and the goats. And um, it's in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will gather before him and he will separate one from another as the shepherd divides the sheep and the goats. He will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me, sick and visited me, in prison you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king said to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it for one of the least of these, my brother, and you did it to me. So we see that those who are on the right hand of God are working for God. They're emulating his character. They're caring for the less fortunate. They're sharing. They're, they're taking care of one another. And there's a lot of, of uh, humility that goes into caring for um, these, these sick and afflicted people. And so um, then on 41, then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you who, you who cursed into the everlasting prior, fire prepared for the devil and his angel. And he goes again about being hungry and naked. And, and, um, and you did, and he says in verse 44, and did not minister to you. Then he will answer them saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And all these will go away into everlasting punishment, but to the right, but into righteousness, into eternal life. And we see in this world today that there are many who work for themselves. They will, um, they, they, they want power, they want money, and everything around them focuses on themselves and what they can personally gain. That is not, that does not emulate Christ. And so... We see then what happens, that the king separates the sheep and the goats based on their works. 
their character. Though Jesus is teaching salvation by works here, we can see how important character development is in the plan of salvation and how those who truly are truly saved by Christ will reflect the salvation through their lives and characters. So in the upward look, it says God calls on his people to be lights to the world, shining in the darkness of sin. And I'll tell you one thing I loved about that. In the lesson, it talks about the oil being the Holy Spirit and also character, right? Mm -hmm. I say they go hand in hand because they the do. more character you have in Christ, the more you can be filled with his spirit. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Wednesday's lesson, the, the wise. wise. Now, I remember what we read earlier about Adam, right? And when he is in the garden, and he would obtain a clearer and yet clearer conceptions of the wisdom, the power, and the love of God. I'm going to say these wise are definitely those that are, are right with God in all of his ways. We're going to start off by reading Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. It is very relevant to the times we are in today. And it reads verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, and who's Michael? Pre-incarnate Christ. Pre Christ. And, you know, post-incarnate in this case as well. But that was his name back then. The great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise. <clears throat> and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book, will be rescued. And that would be the book of life. Verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life. But the others, those that come later, to disgrace and everlasting contempt. And we know that as the second death a thousand years later. Verse 3. Those who have insight will shine brightly. And I love that insight, or dare I say wisdom, will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. And those who lead the many to righteousness, like the stars forever and ever. So how does wisdom begin? What does Solomon say? Fear of the Lord, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, <clears throat> conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth and knowledge will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and beheld. Two others were standing, one on this bank of the river and the other on the other bank of the river. And others are on the same river looking across it. And one said to the man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river. And who's the man in linen? Jesus. Jesus. And the linen denotes his righteousness, the clothing. How long will it be until the end of these wonders? I heard a man dressed in linen who was above the waters of the river and he raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. How long is a time, time, and half a time? 1260 years. Correct, which ended in 1798. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events would be completed. So in other words, any time after 1798. <laughs> um, he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed and sealed up till the end time. Many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. So those that are purged, purified, and, re and refined is about a lesson today. To the point to where they become the brightness of those stars and that they lead many to everlasting life. Um, but let me ask you, the wicked will not understand. Why won't they understand? Because spiritual they chose things, to believe a lie. Well, and spiritual things are discerned spiritually. Yeah. They couldn't understand if they wanted to because they rejected God and the Holy Spirit. So, do you think Jesus is coming? Let's see, COVID, war, rumors of wars. We need a few earthquakes and some other things, and I think we're right <laughs> Don't in line. Don't say it, we may get some. <laughs> no, not in California, though. But, and we might be right... <laughs> 
So, yeah, we're, we're getting there. We're getting very close. And, you know, we've talked about this before. You don't train for a marathon the week beforehand, right? It takes time and diligence and persistence. So these people, the ones with the insight and wisdom that shine so brightly, that lead so many to righteousness, who are they? They're God's remnant church. But let me ask you this. Do you know who the remnant church is? Is it a denomination or is it a people? Well, Ellen White says in Christ's Object Lessons, page 69, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. So since Jesus hasn't come yet, what does that mean? We're not a reflection of his character, not his complete character. Those saints that have the character of Jesus Christ, the very manifestation of Christ in them, working through them, who are they? And this is talking about the end days, right before the second coming. Revelation 14, verses 3 through 5. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000. By the way, that's not a literal number. Um, who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who had not been defiled with women. But first of all, that song that only they can sing, that's the song of the Lamb. And they are only allowed to sing that song because they will be the only people in heaven who will come close to experiencing the trials that Christ himself experienced. Remember at the end that it will be a time of trouble like the world has never seen. And they will live through it. So that's, that's something. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Wouldn't you love to be like that? Wouldn't you love to be in that state to where you're that close to God, to where you share the character? These are the stars that we read in Daniel. These are the saints that have perished beforehand as well, that have fallen asleep in Christ, but especially in those end days. Then how did they become like this? They were refined by fire. Remember, there's one standard of judgment when God comes, when Jesus comes, and that standard is God's law because it is his very character. It's not what I think is right. It's not what Barbara thinks or what Scott thinks. It's what God thinks. And by him refining us and burning that dross from us to purify us as gold that he can see his reflection, it's a painful process. We have hearts of stone. We've seen this before in Scripture. We have to read... We, have to have those hearts broken. Matthew 21, verses 43 and 44. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, that would be the Pharisees, and given to a people, producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone, that would be Christ, will be broken to pieces. But we need to be broken, to be rebuilt, to be those stars. And it continues, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. In other words, you're done for. So if the rock falls on you, you're done. But if you fall on the rock, Christ can rebuild you into a star with his character. Look to the cross daily. Look what Christ has done for us on the cross. The pain and the suffering that he endured at Gethsemane through the scourging, through the separation from the Father for the first and only time in eternity. And let our hearts focus on that, that they might be softened and realize the love that he has for us. 
So much so that it becomes a habit for you and me to do as Jesus would do. I want to read real fast Ellen White, The Sanctified Life. This is it, or this is, thus it is with this truly righteous man. He is unconscious of his goodness and piety. Religious principle has become the spring of his life and conduct. And it is just as natural for him to bear the fruits of the Spirit as for the fig tree to bear figs, or for the rose bush to yield roses. His nature is so thoroughly imbued with, the lo with love for God and his fellow men that he works the works of Christ with a willing heart. All who will come within the sphere of his influence perceive the beauty and fragrance of his Christian life, while he himself is unconscious of it. For it is in harmony with his habits and inclinations. He prays for divine light and loves to walk in that light. It is his meat and drink to do the will of his heavenly Father. His life is hid with Christ in God. Yet he does not boast of this, nor seem conscious of it. God smiles upon the humble and lowly ones who follow closely in the footsteps of the Master. Angels are attracted to him and love to linger about their path. They are, or they may be passed by as unworthy of notice by those who claim exalted attainment and who delight in making prominent their good works. But heavenly angels bend lovingly over them and are as a wall of fire round about them. I want to be one of them. Thank you. Scott, tell so, us about character and community. <clears throat> character and community. Well, it sounded like an interesting <laughs> topic, so today I decided to introduce a fresh analogy into this besides the gold that we we're talking about. I decided to use the creme brulee analogy. So the other week at Costco, I bought these little creme brulee that was pre-made, <laughs> but they actually give you granular brown sugar to put on top. Uh, however, if you eat it like that, it's not very tasty because the sugar is just granules. However, if you take a blowtorch, it says to use a blowtorch or an oven. I didn't have the blowtorch, so I used the oven. Um, you can preheat the oven, and when it comes there, it melts the pieces of sugar together, and it makes a crust over the creme brulee, which gives it a delicious flavor. And it's one crust as opposed to many granules. So there you go. There's my creme brulee analogy that illustrates the character and community. So now let's get to the Bible verses from it. So Paul talks about unity of the Spirit, and um, I decided to read Ephesians 4, 1 to 16 instead of the, just 11 to 16. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a ma manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father who is over all and through all in all. But to each of us was grace given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led, he led a captive he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now the expression, he ascended, uh, what does it mean except also that he had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave them some as apostles, uh, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer children 
tossed here and there by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness in his deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ, from which the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual, causes the growth of the body, building up of love itself. So thus, in this verse, Paul is showing the result of going through trials, affliction, and tribulation, and that will be the unity of Christ's body. An example of this is the disciples of Christ who were subjected to the greatest trial of their lives when their master was betrayed and crucified. And in this affliction, one of the disciples, Judas, was eliminated, so he was part of the dross that was going to be burned up. But the other 11 disciples came into even closer communion with both each other and with Christ, their head. And then um, I wanted to read a little quote from Ellen White here, which says, uh, this comes from the commentary as well from the Sabbath school lesson. It says, to the brother G, Ellen White writes a letter explaining the relation between suffering and purification in the Advent people, preparing for the second coming of Jesus. The purification of the people of God cannot be accomplished without their suffering. Now, I thought that was kind of astonishing and um, disturbing, too. I don't really like the idea personally, but um, nonetheless, I think it must be what it is. It a thing. <laughs> That's true. I was like, um, it seems like it's a necessity from what this comment says. So I'll just repeat that again. Uh, the purification of the people of God cannot be accomplished without their suffering. God permits the fires of affliction to consume the dross, to separate the worthless from the valuable, that the pure metal may shine forth. He passes us from one fire to another, testing our true worth. If we cannot bear this trials, what will we do in the time of trouble? If prosperity or adversity um, discover falseness, pride, or selfishness in our hearts. What shall we do when God tries every man's work by fire and lays bare the secrets of all hearts? True grace um, is willing to be tried. If we are loath to be searched by the Lord, our condition is serious indeed. God is the refiner and purifier of souls. In the heat of the furnace, the dross is separated forever from the true silver and gold of the Christian character. Jesus watches the test. He knows what is needed to purify the precious metal, that it may reflect the radiance of his divine love. And that was from Testimonies to the Church. So, um... It says, so going back towards the lesson, it says, when Paul writes to the Ephesians, he describes the church as a body. So Christ being the head and the people being the rest. Um, and if you look at this verse in Ephesians 4.13, you notice that the ultimate purpose of living in such a community is to experience the whole measure of the fullness of Christ and uh, the need we have for each other. Uh, it is certainly possible for a Christian to be all alone. Indeed, as for many of the people throughout the centuries who have been ridiculed or persecuted, standing alone is often unavoidable. It is a powerful witness to the power of God and men uh, that men and women do not buckle under the pressure that surround them. While this is true, Paul emphasizes a critical truth. Ultimately, we experience and reveal the fullness of Christ when we are working together in fellowship with each other. So I think this is an important point, which is that the, the trials actually bring us not just closer to God, but closer to each other. And one of the signs that um, we're ready for Christ's coming is when we are united. And I was going to end here with one last quote. Um, it says, God's work of refining and purifying must go on until his servants are so humbled, so dead to self, 
when called into active service that their eye will be single to his glory. He will then accept their efforts and they will not move rashly from impulse. They will not rush on and imperil the Lord's cause, being slaves to temptations and passions and uh, followers of their own carnal minds set on fire by Satan. <clears throat> oh, how fearfully is the cause of God marred by man's perverse and unsubdued temper. How much suffering he brings upon himself by following his own headstrong passions. Now this, this is another interesting point is that we're bringing, sometimes we bring our trials on ourselves because we have headstrong passions. So that, that's kind of a, a point to learn is that some of the trials are not necessarily brought over by God or Satan, they're brought up by ourselves. Um, God brings men over the ground again and again, increasing the pressure until perfect humility and transformation of character bring them into harmony with Christ and the Spirit of Heaven, and they are victorious over themselves. The end. <laughs> Thank you. Well, <clears throat> we've learned from this lesson this week that the trials that we go through as much as we don't like them, is really for our own good. That God has a purpose. <clears throat> and that is a perf perp the purpose is sanctifying and purifying us so that we are ready to meet him. We have to remember, sin cannot live in the presence of God. No. And so we kind of have a choice. It gets burnt out of our lives while we're here on earth or it will be burnt in the end. Or, and I, I will choose to have it burnt in this life. Or you don't even burn you when it comes if it's not completely eradicated. I know. The thing that we need to remember too is he suffered more than we can be called upon to suffer. And this is more of testimonies that, that um, Scott was, was reading to us. He bore our infirmities and was in, in all points tempted as we are. He did not suffer thus on his own account but because of our sins. And now we're relying on his merits to overcome, that we may be, be victors in his name. I think sometimes we look at all of the prosperity gospel and listen to the prosperity preachers out there and think, well, life should be easy. Why should, why should I have difficulties? But if you look at Christ's life, his was not an easy life. It was a difficult life. And... He, he, he went through many difficult times. And he spent his time working for us and working for others. And so as we go through our trials, let's look to God and ask, what is it that you need me to remove from my life? And what is it that you would have me to learn? Rather than saying, why me? And let's learn to do it the first time so we don't have to repeat. <laughs> I know. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for this lesson. Thank you for reminding us that all things that are done are for our good. You have told us that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So even, Lord, that we may be facing trials today, that we may not understand what is ahead of us, you will not ask us to suffer more than you did, that you will have answers for each of our questions, and that when we come out on the other side, Lord, May we be purified so that as we work for you, it will be all to your honor and to your glory. And thank you, Lord, that you came and died for us, that you're sitting on your throne now, and you're watching us, watching over us for our good in all ways and all things. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.